Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you here. It's a chance to worship today. And um, just check your worship folder for what's going on. Um, uh, there are a couple uh, items here there. And, um, we have a missionary family in Beirut, and uh, their apartment was damaged, so they had to move out of that and in with some friends. But they are safe uh, after that explosion um, downtown, which uh, devastated so much of the, the the, the urban area there. Um, so just check that and whatever else is going on this week. And the um, bins are always out for the rescue mission. And we're just glad to be here. Anything else we need to know for the, the good of the body? Okay, then I invite Ben to come up and lead us into worship. Good morning and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church. Whether you're here in person or watching online, uh, we're glad to have you. Uh, this morning for our call to worship, I'm going to be praying through uh, Psalm 95, uh, 1 through 7. So if you would, bow your head and pray with me. Heavenly Father, uh, we come, uh, come let us sing before you. Let us make a joyful noise to you, our rock of our salvation. Let us come into your presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to you with songs of praise. For you are the Lord are our great God and a great king above all gods. In your hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are yours also. The sea is yours, for you made it, and your hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down before you, O God. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for you are our God, and we are the people of your pasture and the sheep of your hand. Today let us hear your voice. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Let's stand together and sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Let's stand together and sing. join me as we offer our prayer of thanksgiving. Our most gracious and good Heavenly Father, it is so good to be here together today in your presence to worship. Lord, we ask that right now you would fill our hearts and fill our souls with the peace and the truth that only you can bring. Lord, we thank you for the safety and security that we always have in you, our rock and our redeemer. Lord, you know when we rise up, you know when we lie down. Lord, there's nothing that happens in this world that happens outside of your hand, out of your control. 
And so, Lord, we ask that you would, again, uh, be, be blessed by the praises of your people this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Join me in singing, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Let's now affirm our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Oh. 
may be seated. Uh, please join me in reading God's word uh, in unison from Revelation 19, verses 6 through 10. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This image which comes out of uh, which runs throughout scripture, which we'll look at more today, this image of marriage within scripture. Uh, if you remember several years ago, we spent an entire summer looking at this theology of marriage as it's laid out in scripture and why it's so important. And we'll look a little bit at that today because Paul talks about uh, betrothal in particular. But this points to the wedding feast of the lamb and, and, and when, when all things come to fruition, that day which will come soon in, in the future, uh, and the day that we look forward to, um, that we can rejoice for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linens, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints, those which have been prepared beforehand, that we should do them and live in them, and have them as an outgrowth of who we are as believers. So let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you today, and um, we see this image, and, and we know that, that marriage, betrothal, are all mirrors of our relationship, the relationship of the church with Christ, pointers to what is to be fulfilled in the final days. So, Lord, we, we live in that expectation, whether it's in our lives that we see that come, or whether in our deaths when we stand before you and, and, and know the fulfillment of all the promises that we have seen in Scripture, we, we look forward to those days. And, Lord, we know that there are uh, families within our congregation uh, who have lost and, and, and friends um, and, and we're thankful for the example of their lives. Um, however imperfect they have been, yet they did point to you because you were at work. We think of the Collins family and, and uh, death of Peggy's dad and ask your hand of mercy and grace upon them. Lord, I have friends who have passed away, the Crane family, uh, the Lammy family. Lord, we pray that your mercy would rest upon them. Strengthen them, Lord. Uh, and see them through, that they would be reminded um, that uh, their loved ones have, have reached the fulfillment of what they believed, that they can see clearly who Christ is, that they know the fulfillment of the forgiveness that he granted in this world as they have experienced it now. Lord, we think of our uh, missionaries in places uh, such as Lebanon, uh, dangerous places to start with. And now with uh, this explosion and, and the decimation of so much of downtown Beirut and, um, Lord, the upheavals and, and all that will come with that um, just in the lives but also in the ministry that they do. 
in, in the lives that they will touch. We, we pray that in your providence, Lord, uh, you would use this tragedy uh, to open doors and open the eyes and hearts of individuals that they, they may question why or, or look for reasons and they may find their answers in the person and work and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. For it is in he that we find real peace and we find grace and mercy and we find the real answers to what our hearts seek. Lord, let, let that missionary family proclaim those things with boldness now that many hearts would be receptive to you. That they also may minister and care for, for the physical needs as much as they can. And, and, and we in the, the EPC may support them and help them in whatever way possible. Uh, Lord, that the gospel may be heard. Heavenly Father, for our church planters in this country, um, we think of James and of uh, Kirk and of uh, Terrence and of Michael and of uh, Mark out in, in Colorado. Lord, grant them your grace and peace. Open the eyes and hearts of those around them that they may be uh, receptive to Jesus Christ. You do the work, Lord. Open their eyes. Use these um, men and, 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 and their families, uh, protect them, but use them in a powerful way, Lord, that we may see change, change in individual hearts, change in the world around them. And Lord, for us here, uh, you brought us here uh, in the midst of all that else is going on in our society and, um, to worship you. And for Lord, for those who boldly go uh, to worship uh, we are grateful for them. And for those who uh, are not ready and stay home, that's great too, Lord. And we pray your blessing upon each of us as we hear your word, as we are challenged with what you have for us, that we may live it out in this new reality, whatever it's going to be, whatever it is, that those we come in contact with, Lord, the light of Christ may shine even through a mask, even through a distance, that you would be seen you would be heard in our lives and in our words. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you and we are thankful for the opportunities uh, that you give. And, and this change in our world is not, a, uh, not unexpected from you. For in your providence, and uh, you have planned this out uh, from all eternity. And now we are to walk in this and to live in this and to live as Christians in this. Help us to see it. Help us to do it that your name would be praised. So, Lord, we come to you not on our own work, but on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And we gather together and we pray together the prayer that he taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> now, if you came through the front doors, you saw that we've redone the, the entryway of the concrete. So instead of five different pours, uh, there's only one there. And uh, the plan is to uh, work the sidewalk all the way around till it meets uh, the, this sidewalk over here with a grass strip just to make it look better. Um, I'm sure all our neighbors on Randolph would be, be pleased that our sidewalk is looking better. And it will be safer, less cracks and things like that. Um, so just an update on that. Um, thank you for uh, your faithfulness in giving. The plates are at the doors or uh, many of you have been sending in your checks through mail. We're grateful for that. It's just a, a testimony to what the Lord is doing and what the Lord has for us yet in store. So I invite Bess to come. Make known the power of his 
grace, the beauty of his peace. Remember how his mercy reached, and we cried out to him. He lifted us to solid ground, to freedom from our sin. We come this morning to the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians. I invite you to turn in your worship folder or in your own Bible there. Uh, as I read uh, our passage for today, we're going to look at the first six verses of chapter 11. And this is going to be a, an ongoing, uh, there's a lot in chapter 11, so uh, in the next couple of weeks we'll still be uh, working through that. So if you're able, would you please stand with me? As I read the Word of God, our Heavenly Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes and our hearts today, that we would have understanding of this, uh, why it is so important, these words that Paul has given us, uh, this imagery and these truths, that our lives would reflect that, that we would live them out, Lord, that you would be seen in all of our actions, in all of our attitudes. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. So the first six verses of chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you received a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. And we would put those in quotes, okay? Paul's being kind of sarcastic here. Those super apostles, that's what they call themselves. 
Verse 6, even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. So this is God's inspired word for us today. So please be seated. So this is part of what Paul is telling the Corinthians and us about our loyalty to Christ and the importance of identifying and being able to identify false apostles. Now, um, uh, it's clear that, um, and, and we'll look at this in just a moment, uh, the responsibility of truth, truth, that's a quite right how I want to put it, the responsibility to make sure that we uh, understand that the truth is being declared, that it is in line with what God teaches here, really first falls to the pastor, but then to the elders. Because if the pastor gets out of line, the elders are supposed to know enough to say, hey, Rand, uh, I don't think you were right here. You better go back and check that. Okay, You better go back and make sure. Uh, because uh, we're supposed to be, not that we're any closer to God, but we're supposed to be better informed. I spent my, uh, my adult life studying this and been to school, and, and you know, I got letters after my names, but, but it doesn't mean anything if I don't do it right. And same thing with the elders. Their responsibility is to make sure that we stay on the right track. And Paul comes and says, guys, we got to make sure you have to be able to identify a false apostle. And a false apostle, uh, a short version, errs always when it comes to Christ. Okay, the, the work of Christ. They they have to they choke on the things of Christ. We see that in sects. We see that in cults. They always have to diverge from the pure teaching of of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And and how do we know these things? Well, we know these things from what God's word says. And that big package of information that is laid out for us in Scripture is called doctrine. Okay, Doctrine is defined uh, as a held belief or set of beliefs, a principle or position, or the body of principles in a branch of knowledge or system of belief. Doctrine is unavoidable in life. There's doctrine of all types of things. I have a pastor friend uh, who, before he became a pastor, was, was a football coach. And his master's thesis was on goal line defense. Okay, now, that may be the only one in the world that's on goal line defense. And he, yeah, we were talking uh, one day, and he said, oh, I've got this whole doctrine of goal line defense. Okay, so even in football, there are doctrines within life in general. So here we typically only talk about doctrine in the context of Christianity. Okay. And, and, and the doctrines that Orthodox believers hold to. When I say Orthodox believers, I don't mean Russian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox. I mean those believers who have historically stood within the Orthodox teachings of Scripture. Okay, We fall within those, those parameters. Only sometimes do we look at false doctrines, usually to illustrate how far away from the truth people have gone. Now, in my younger years, there was a, an adage... Uh, that was kind of common. Service unites and doctrine divides. Anybody hear that one before? Service unites and doctrine divides. Well, that comes from a conference that was held in Stockholm in 1925. And it was kind of an ecumenical group. And they decided that, well, you know, we come together from all these different places. And, and what is, what's dividing us? Well, it's these beliefs that we hold around, in and around Scripture. What unites us? Well, our service of the things that God calls us to do. So let's forget about our doctrinal differences and let's unite around service. Now, they may have been worthy tasks, but when you divorce a task from the proclamation of the gospel, um, then you get nothing but a band-aid. You don't get a real answer. You don't get a real uh, conclusion to the needs of people's hearts. It's good to feed people, but if you feed people without the proclamation of the gospel... Uh, that, that's a problem, okay? And Christ calls us to do things like that, but it comes with the gospel, not divorced from it. And, and we think, well, Rand, you look at doctrine, and what good has come from all these different doctrinal views? I mean, people were burned at the stake for holding different views, right? Well, not recently. I mean, we haven't had a fire in the backyard for years, I, I guess, I, you know. Well, we get all worked up over something that, that Bo may interpret this way and I may interpret this way and Bess may interpret this way. Why well, get worked up over those things? Because doctrine is what we stand on. It comes from Scripture. 
There is no such thing as a non-doctrinal Christianity. Okay, true doctrine will divide us. Okay, it is clear. We have Presbyterians, we have Methodists, we have Baptists. Uh, they're, they're, it's across the board there. People have differing views concerning theological issues. All those, those groups that I mentioned are all united on the saving work of Christ. But there are other things that, that, that we uh, hold as distinctives, that are doctrines over here, doctrines over there. But Christ taught that the gospel would bring divisions, even among family members. Now, we don't like divisions, but false doctrines have to be exposed. And that's what Paul is talking about here. So the real question is not whether Christians will have doctrines, but which doctrines and whose doctrines. That's what we're dealing with. The Gospels are full of doctrinal teaching. Okay? The nature of God, John chapter 4. The nature of man, Matthew chapter 10. Creation, Mark 10. Sin and its effects, John chapter 8. Redemption, John chapter 3. The church, Matthew chapter 16. The end times, Matthew 24. Those are just the smattering of the doctrinal teachings that are listed within the teachings of Christ. So anyone who advocates that we don't need doctrine is advocating a, a, Christless, a Christless faith. And a Christless faith is really no faith at all. So there are plenty of false teachings out there today. And, and if I were to give you a list of those, we would be here quite a while. But one that seems to have reared its ugly head again uh, in the current issues within society uh, stems from a teaching that so goes all the way back to the 60s, and, and I'll point that out in just a moment. But this new false teaching promotes sin as something due to do with systems and removes the human influence and the human sinfulness and the responsibility that each of us has as humans um, to find redemption for our sinfulness and then to live into that new life. This, this false teaching says if you tear down the systems and build new systems, then they'll be better, well, there'll be justice, there'll be economic, uh, eco economies will flourish, etc. They forget that the people still run those systems, right? Uh, that I'm still sinful, so if, if I'm running a system, then that means my sin influences that system. Now, all this comes, as I said, from the 60s and the teaching that grew up in Central and South America, really, which was a, a union of Roman Catholicism and Marxism called liberation theology. We see that in uh, some of the mainline churches. We see that in uh, the outcome of black liberation theology, which is taught in some churches. Um, this comes from an economic uh, theory. There's a social theory, which is called critical theory, which takes that and applies it in society as well. So you may have heard of the term critical theory, now, that's just two sentences on each one. So if you really want to know more about it, you'll have to go and dig through it, okay? So I'm not going to give you a list of all the bad doctrines. It would take too long. Suffice to say that those, there are those who create a false doctrine out of their human need. Where does false doctrine usually come? So it usually arises from within the church and comes out of our human understanding, not out of Scripture. Let's look at a couple instances. Uh, I'm suffering terribly. Therefore, God is distant and does not care. Would that be true? No. Because God promises, once you're here, I will never let you go. We look at the world. There's war, the resulting consequences, famine, disease, uh, rampant. The innocent are suffering. Therefore, God must be not powerful enough to do anything about it. Because if he's a just God, then he wouldn't let those things happen. That's a false doctrine. I see chaos. I see violence, anarchy running wild. Therefore, God must be unjust if he allows these things. Okay, those are false doctrines created by man. Those who create an image of what God is like outside of what he says here is creating a God that looks just like me. Just like me. So what does good doctrine do? Well, good biblical theology, solid doctrine, does two things. It guards the purity and the power of the church. The purity and the power of the church. Good doctrine ensures that the gospel will be preached. It will be taught, it not some moralistic, uh, ear-tickling, uh, man-friendly, powerless message. 
Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's what changes lives. Moralistic messages don't change lives. Messages that sound good don't change lives. Uh, moral, uh, messages that, that really are make me feel good. Now, sometimes the gospel makes me feel good. But messages that are aimed at purely making me feel good about my life do not have the power to change my life. It is the gospel message. Say, Randy, that's pretty uh, elementary, okay? Are you sure? that you're, you're, Maybe you're oversimplifying it. No, that is the truth. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes life, changes lives, and then enables us through the presence of the Holy Spirit to live differently and live those things out which the gospel teaches us. That's the power to change a life, and then you have the power to change the world. Jesus did not have... 500 apostles. At how many? At 12. 12. Okay? And one of those went rogue. Okay? And, and then about three months after he left the world, how many disciples did they have? Uh, thousands. Okay? Thousands. Peter preached a sermon. 3,000 were added. Preached another sermon. 5,000 were added that day. That's just the men. Okay, so we're talking about perhaps 20,000 added to the church in that short time. How is that possible? Because the gospel changes lives. That's the message there. Good doctrine focuses us on the church's mission, sharing the good news, making disciples, not just doing the works that he calls us to, because the works are necessary and natural outgrowths of a changed life. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 those things which he has prepared before the foundations of the world that we would do that would give him glory. Good doctrine keeps us rooted in why we live counterculturally. See, we just don't go along with a culture. And if you find yourself going along with a culture, and the culture doesn't seem so bad, right? I don't know why you get so worked up over it. You're probably not paying close enough attention to the gospel because the culture will naturally move further and further away from what Christ taught and what Paul and the other disciples taught because it wants to please itself. Doctrine says no. Our goal is to please Christ. Our motivation for a life of service, for times of sacrifice, for generosity beyond what the world thinks is necessary, beyond what uh, the world thinks is normal according to ethics and mores, this is what Christ calls us to do, to do and how to live. We will be countercultural. Good doctrine can also be rather unpleasant because it causes, it causes us to be different, okay? And I don't like to be different. I kind of like getting along and going along because everybody's going that direction and, and if I you know, turn around and go in a different direction, then I'm going to make people mad. I'm going to be uh, against people. I'm going to hold different views than people. And maybe you've hit some people that you have different views with and they get angry about it. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's not always the most pleasant thing. But yet that's what the gospel says will happen. So in chapter 11, uh, we go back to chapter 10, and Paul has been kind of talking about personal things, and Dan did a great job covering chapter 10 because that is a hard chapter. Um, but now he goes into doctrine, and why does he go into a doctrine-focused message? Verse 2, he says, I feel a divine jealousy for you, a divine jealousy. Literally, the Greek says a jealousy of God for you, a jealousy of God. He loves these people, but more importantly, God and Paul will not share them with anybody else. Okay, think about it for a moment. Here you are. I'll just pick on Randy. Been married 30, over more than 30 years. Sorry. <laughs> Would I share Judy with anybody else? Uh, uh, no, All right, that just doesn't happen. Would I have shared Judy with somebody else when we were just engaged? No, that was just not going to happen. Because when, you, when I got engaged, I'd pledged my life to her and she to me, and we would not share with one, our, our, each other with anybody else. And there was a jealousy there. Okay, Maybe it was unspoken in my heart. I saw her talk to another guy. I'm like, what's going on over there? 
Okay, he's handsomer than I am. I better go, go in there and interject myself in that conversation, just in case. Okay, just in case. It's a jealousy that Paul and that God has for his people, for his people. Remember the commandment says what? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That, there's no exception there. There's no exception. Paul says he has betrothed them to Christ. One husband, and he must keep them pure. Now, what's the purpose of this imagery? As, as, as I said earlier, there's a lot of wedding, marriage, and engagement or betrothal imagery throughout all of Scripture. So given the economy of words within Scripture, this must be pretty important. Okay, not just here, but th this image throughout all of Scripture. Paul says that I might present you as a pure virgin. But I'm afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. So Paul is talking to them using an analogy that they readily understood because this whole, uh, the association of all these things, betrothal and wedding, were very important in first century Jewish culture. Okay? So as soon as Paul begins to talk about it, everybody knows what he is referring to. And throughout Scripture, we see that there's this comparison between our relationship to Christ, the bride, and the groom. In the Old Testament, Israel's the husband, God is, or Israel's the wife, God is the husband, and how marriage is a reflection of that in this life. Let me give you just a couple examples from Scripture. Matthew chapter 25 and the, the parable of the ten virgins. And remember that the the bride and her wedding party with 10 of her friends have gone to her house and they're waiting the arrival of the groom. And the groom would come across town with his wedding party and it would be a big thing. Everybody in town would know it, but they don't, the, the bride and her wedding party don't know when they're coming. So she has 10 of her friends. Five of them don't have enough oil for their lamps to keep them lit. And oil is typically a, 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 an illustration, uh, an allegory for the Holy Spirit within Scripture. But five do. So the five keep watch, and the other five kind of go to sleep and let their lamps burn out. The groom comes, and off they go. And the five are like, well, well, wait a minute. What about us? And we see later in that chapter, when you have this, this great wedding feast, uh, you know, when, when the, the bridegroom was delayed and the, and the, uh, the, 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 the uh, the, the ladies didn't pay attention. Then they show up at the feast, and Jesus says, uh, be, be, go away from me. I don't know you. You're not coming in. Don't let anybody in who doesn't have the right clothing on. In fact, he throws one out when he sees that they didn't. How did you get in here? Okay, this isn't correct. This isn't correct. And then when we try to enter the kingdom, what terrible words that we would hear from Christ. And, and, and think of the people who have believed, who thought that they were saved, who thought that because they went through the motions, I mean, they sat in church for years and heard the message, but their heart were never, was never changed. Maybe they uh, got up at a, uh, a retreat at some point and made a profession, but their life was never changed. Okay, I'm, I'm convinced that Scripture teaches that if your life is changed, it will you will see it in fruit. In Matthew, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father will enter the kingdom of heaven. So many on that day will say, Lord, didn't we uh, prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do mighty works in your name? And here are the most terrible words that you could ever hear. Depart from me, for I never knew you. Here you get right, in a sense, right to the gate of heaven. And there you are. You can almost like see it. You can almost taste it. It's there. And Jesus says, no, depart from me. I, I don't know who you are. You don't belong to me. There'll be those who profess Christ, but don't truly possess Christ. Isaiah chapter 54, for your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who, called, who is called the God of all the earth. Hosea, that great uh, prophet who, whose life is really a, a reflection of God's relationship with Israel. Hosea 2, it will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that you will call me my husband and will no longer call me my master, 
Jeremiah 3. Return, O faithless sons, declares the Lord, for I am a master to you, and I will take you one from a city and two from a family and bring you into Zion as a family. Jeremiah 31 it says, this new covenant is not like the covenant which I made with your fathers the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them. Ezekiel 16 is a great passage. I just encourage you to read Ezekiel, the entire chapter this week. It talks about Christ. Or it talks about God finding Israel as, a, as an abandoned child and taking that child into his arms and into his life and caring for them and then watching it grow. John chapter 3, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him, hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is the joy that has been made full. Of course, Revelation 9, Revelation 19, uh, Matthew 9, Revelation 19 that we read. And of course, Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. That's Christ's desire for us, that we would be able to be holy and blameless before him. That's Paul's desire for the church at Corinth. And that's, those are tough words for the church at Corinth because it's a tough place. So Paul's job is to make certain that the Corinthian believers are presented to God as theologically and doctrinally pure as possible. As a bride kept by her father. Now this is taken from the example of the first century in the wedding imagery. So the two ceremonies of the Jewish life constituted parts of a covenant. You had the betrothal and then you had the wedding. So there were two distinct events leading to the fulfillment of it. Now the betrothal, what we would call engagement, usually lasted uh, a year and was time for preparation for the bride and, and also often time for the groom. Either he was going to go back to his father's house, John chapter 14, remember this image, and build a wing onto his father's house so that at the end of that year he may go across town with his entourage and collect his bride and, with her entourage and take her back to the place that he had prepared for her. John chapter 14 again. Or sometimes it was a year where the groom had to save up money, okay, and work really hard to pay the dad of the bride, the bride price. So the time of betrothal was also an opportunity for the bride to prove her purity, her character, her loyalty, and her faithfulness to the groom when there was none of the benefits of marriage. Betrothal contracts in the first century were legal, morally and spiritually binding. Think of Joseph and Mary, okay? They were not yet married, but, you know, Joseph says, oh, Mary's with child. Um, this is bad. We're engaged. What am I going to do? And he thinks to himself, I'm going to put her away. I'm going to divorce her quietly. And then the angel comes to her. Joseph says, I'm going to divorce her because it was considered marriage, but it had not been consummated. At this point, if you broke an engagement, if you broke a betrothal contract, you could even face the death penalty for doing so. This was very, very serious business. So during this period between betrothal and the wedding, it was the specific responsibility of the father to make sure that his daughter remained pure and prepared herself for the wedding. Now, for those of us with lots of daughters, we, we, maybe this hits home more than, than others. Um, it is our job to protect and to care for and to make sure that they are ready so that on that day of the wedding, when the bride and her dad in, in today's world walks, that door opens, and the groom, which is down here, sees her in, his, in her wedding dress for the first time. And they come down the aisle. And the father gives the hand of his daughter to the groom. Okay, That's the image of today. 
Well, you know, sometimes in today's world, the groom walks up the aisle and gets the bride. And then some days, uh, uh, some, past, some weddings, the, the bride just walks down on her own. But in first century Jewish culture, it was paramount that dad watched over his daughter. So on that wedding day, she was pure and holy to be given to the groom. And that's what Paul is saying here. I betrothed you to Christ. You belong to him. We are in the engagement period, and it is my job to watch over you and to care for you and to keep all other suitors away. Okay, That was one of the jobs of the father in the first century in Jewish culture. Keep the daughter away from any other guys. Okay, And Paul says, I've got to keep you away from any other false teachers. You've got to understand why, because you're betrothed to Christ. No bad teachings, nothing that will lead you away from your purity in Christ. This is every pastor's job. This is the elder's job, the responsibilities to make sure that you get the truth, that you may live the Christian life, that you can strive for holiness. We have to understand, demonstrate compassion, uh, justice, and grace, and all those things, but we must do so out of the pure doctrine that comes from Scripture, not something that's man-made, not something that is a corruption of what God's Word says, so that on the day we meet Christ face to face, we are clothed in His righteousness and His holiness alone. So Paul's the father of the bride. That's basically what he says. I betroth you to one husband, Jesus Christ. See, the church is engaged to Christ, waiting for that marriage ceremony, waiting for the entry into the permanent intimacy that we will experience with Christ, waiting to go to the house of the bridegroom. We're betrothed to Christ, and he's going to come back, and he's going to collect us, whether it is tomorrow or whether it's in another 2,000 years. Our job is to be ready for the wedding because right now we're engaged. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, this wonderful imagery of of marriage, of engagement, you've given them to us so that we might see who we are in Christ. So that we might understand this close bond and the requirements that are laid upon us to strive for holiness, strive for purity so that we might be presented to Christ clothed in the right garments, the garments of Christ, righteousness, holiness, purity, those things which only Christ provides. Lord, help us to see what is false. Help us to see by holding it up to Scripture where there, there is divergence from from your word in this world, in teachings, that we might hold fast to what is pure, to what is holy, to what is righteous and what is just. That on the day of the great wedding feast, we would be clothed in the right clothes, the clothes of Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Let's stand together and sing. My Jesus.
Our Heavenly Father, you've made a way in which we can understand our relationship to you and to Christ as a husband and a wife. And we see this laid out in Scripture that Christ is the perfect bridegroom. He cares for us. He works to prepare us. And we sometimes uh, stray away from him. We sometimes are errant, sometimes forgetful. But, Lord, you are faithful and you are merciful. Come upon us, Lord. Help us. Let's start today and this week and this month so that we can be faithful to Christ. So that in this time that we await his return, in this time that we live in this world, no matter how chaotic it seems to us, but not to you, how strange, how, e how much we think evil is flourishing, we are called to be faithful to the one to whom we are pledged, to Jesus Christ. Make your face shine upon us, Lord, that we may walk in holiness today and every day. In Christ's name we ask this. Amen.